In late 2025, analysts tracking ship construction in China have had no shortage of material. The Department of Defense assesses China's Navy as the world's largest by number, with a battle force of over 370 ships and submarines, including more than 140 major surface combatants. Against that backdrop, the U.S. Navy's battle force remains around the 295 to 300 ship range in recent official accounting. Capable, global, and combat experienced, but under pressure from maintenance backlogs and shipbuilding throughput constraints. Then, on December 22, 2025, President Donald Trump announced that his administration intends to pursue a new class of large U.S. Navy warships that he repeatedly labeled battleships, part of what he called a golden fleet. The Navy's public messaging and multiple major outlets reported the first ship's name as USS Defiant and the class as Trump Class. It is important to be precise about scale. Reported displacement figures cluster around approximately 30,000 to 40,000 tons, about three times an Arleigh Burke destroyer, but not larger than U.S. aircraft carriers or big deck amphibious assault ships. The claim is not that America announced the biggest warship since World War II. The accurate claim is that America announced the most ambitious battleship-like surface combatant concept in generations, paired with an explicit message, rebuild maritime capacity and deter great power conflict. The U.S. Navy's last battleship era ended decades ago. The Navy's final Iowa-class battleship to leave active service was USS Missouri, decommissioned in 1992. So why resurrect the label now? The administration's public rationale echoed in press coverage centers on three intertwined ideas. One, magazine depth and endurance in missile defense. Modern surface combat has a math problem. Defensive missiles are expensive and saturation threats can force high expenditure rates. In the Red Sea fight against Houthi missiles and drones, U.S. ships reportedly fired large numbers of interceptors in short windows, illustrating the strain that sustained air and missile defense can create. Two, the pacing challenge in the Indo-Pacific. DOD's China assessment emphasizes that China fields a large and increasingly modern force of multi-mission combatants, while also benefiting from massive national shipbuilding capacity. Three, Industrial base urgency. The U.S. builds a very small share of global commercial tonnage, while China's share is dominant by multiple measures used in public analysis. The point is not symbolism. It is strategic resilience, surge capacity, repair capacity, and sustained output in a long conflict. Here is what makes the December 22nd announcement unusual. It was framed as a decisive new direction, yet it is not currently an approved acquisition program in the way a funded ship class is. Under federal law and normal DOD acquisition practice, Congress must authorize and appropriate the money for development and construction. In other words, the signal is real. The program is still conditional. Battleships did not disappear because naval power declined. They disappeared because aviation and missiles changed the cost-to-effect equation. After World War II, carriers offered reach and flexibility. By the Cold War's end, even modernized battleships, with cruise missiles added, were expensive to crew and operate relative to their unique contributions. The final Iowa class left service in 1992. What has changed since then is less about nostalgia and more about missile air density. Surface combatants now serve as primary air and missile defense nodes for fleets and partners. Threat inventories, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and one-way attack drones are proliferating. The U.S. Navy is investing in layered defenses including Aegis upgrades and the Spy-6 family of radars. The Arleigh Burke destroyer remains the workhorse example. It carries 90 VLS cells on early flights and 96 VLS cells on Flight 2A and 3 variants. Excellent capability in a destroyer hull, but still finite. Meanwhile, China's top-end surface combatant growth is not theoretical. Open-source professional defense reporting commonly describes China's Type 055 Renhai as a 13,000-ton class with 112 VLS cells, and DOD assesses China's Navy as already the world's largest by number. That context helps explain why U.S. decision-makers would talk about a bigger magazine ship concept again, even as serious analysts debate whether a very large, expensive surface combatant is the right answer. Specific loadout claims, exact VLS counts, exact railgun energy, exact laser power, exact hypersonic missile range have not been formally published by the Navy as validated requirements for this new class. What is credibly reported is the administration's intent 
and the types of technologies discussed publicly. Layer 1, sensors and combat systems, what's plausible and already real. The Flight 3 Arleigh Burke upgrade is centered on SPY-6, and the Navy publicly describes SPY-6 as dramatically increasing sensitivity and improving detection, tracking, and discrimination of complex threats. If a Trump-class hull proceeds, integrating established components, Aegis-derived combat system elements, SPY-6 family radar, and standard launch infrastructure would be the most realistic path to reduce developmental risk. Layer 2, missiles and magazine depth, what is known versus what is speculative. The president and major outlets describe these ships as carrying hypersonic weapons and nuclear-armed sea-launch cruise missiles. Hypersonics, CPS. The Navy's conventional prompt strike, CPS effort, is real and funded in RDT&E. Public CRS reporting notes ongoing integration activity and highlights that procurement quantities and full operational effectiveness remain works in progress. Nuclear Slickum. The U.S. has discussed and pursued a nuclear sea-launched cruise missile concept, SLICMN, in policy and budget debates. However, that is not the same thing as a fielded, deployed weapon today. Layer 3. Directed Energy and Railguns. Reality check, not science fiction. Railgun. AP reporting explicitly noted the Navy abandoned or suspended its railgun effort in 2021 after years of costly development challenges. Japan has also publicly discussed at-sea railgun testing activity in 2025 in multiple reports, reinforcing that the technology remains an active area of interest, but not a solved, ready-for-fleet integration weapon. Lasers. The Navy has fielded and tested multiple shipboard-directed energy efforts, dazzlers, and higher power systems over time, but public reporting, especially CRS, frames these as evolving capabilities with limitations not a fleet-wide mature substitute for missiles. Layer 4, what the Navy actually said about acquisition direction. A key new fact, James reported a Navy official saying the Trump-class program would abandon DDGX, a major shift from prior planning narratives. If pursued, this concept changes four things. Without pretending the outcome is guaranteed. One, deterrence messaging and operational posture. A very large surface combatant relative to destroyers with large magazine capacity could complicate an adversary's planning, especially if paired with distributed maritime operations and undersea and air power integration. That said, survivability depends on doctrine, signatures, defenses, networking, and numbers, not displacement alone. Two, cost exchange pressure becomes front and center. The Navy's Red Sea experience illustrates why cost exchange discussions won't go away. Using multi-million dollar interceptors against cheaper one-way threats can be necessary and still strategically unfavorable if repeated at scale. Reported FY 2025 budget figures have been used to estimate per-missile costs on the order of approximately $2.5 million for SM-2 and approximately $4.3 million for SM-6, estimates derived from budget totals and quantities. 3. Industrial base becomes strategy, not just logistics. Public analysis repeatedly underscores how far U.S. commercial shipbuilding share lags China's and why that matters for repair, surge, and sustained production. Four, it forces a hard conversation about priorities. If DDGX is truly being displaced, the Navy is trading one future force design path for another. That trade will echo across escort capacity, missile defense coverage, and shipyard loading for decades. Now the reality check, grounded in what is actually reported. Timeline. Multiple reports indicate construction is not expected until the early 2030s, not immediately. Cost. Public estimates vary widely. Reporting has cited ranges from roughly $5 billion to $15 billion. Wide. While other accounts cite approximately $10 billion to $12 billion per ship. Narrower, still speculative. Governance. Congress must ultimately authorize and appropriate funds under normal acquisition rules, meaning this announcement is best understood as intent and direction setting, not a funded contract for holes tomorrow. And there is another sober point. Recent U.S. shipbuilding history is mixed. Programs like Zumwalt were truncated, Ford faced well-documented technical challenges, and as we recently reported, the Navy has moved to cut back the Constellation-class frigate by amid delays and cost growth. Still, it is also true that the United States retains unmatched advantages 
in joint integration, allies, undersea warfare, carrier aviation, ISR, and global operational experience. The strategic question is not whether America can build. The question is whether this specific approach, very large surface combatants with advanced but partly immature technologies, improves warfighting outcomes per dollar and per year. If the Trump class becomes a funded program with defined requirements, the next decisive milestone will be straightforward. A real budget line, a real design, and a build contract, followed by performance, schedule, and cost discipline worthy of the sailors who will one day take her to sea. So here's where we land. This isn't nostalgia. It's a pressure test of American industry, American strategy, and America's willingness to build the kind of naval power that doesn't just win the opening salvo, but can endure the fight that follows. If the Trump class becomes steel in the water, it won't be because the U.S. Navy missed battleships. It'll be because the missile era is forcing every Navy on Earth to answer the same brutal question. Can you keep fighting after your first magazine is empty? And that's the real story. Because in the Pacific, deterrence isn't a slogan. It's capacity. It's logistics. It's sustained combat power at scale. So now I want to hear from you. Is a massive magazine ship the right move? Or is it a very expensive distraction from building more destroyers, submarines, and unmanned fleets? Drop your take in the comments. Until next time, stay sharp.